The New York Mets won their third series in a row on Monday, taking the third game of their four-game set against the Miami Marlins. I'll talk about that game on the show today, but also a lot of roster moves to discuss. Dominic Smith is back with the team. Max Scherzer is on a rehab assignment. Seth Lugo on paternity leave. There were some injuries in the game today as well, so a lot to unpack there. And I will also preview the upcoming two-game set as the Mets head to Houston to play the first half of what's going to be a a split series here against the Astros, playing them again next week. We'll go through all of that on this edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter, at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Now, you look at this Mets team, once again, comes through with another series victory. They also shut out a team again, something they've done a lot this year. This was the 11th shutout of the season within their first 69 games, which is just the third time in franchise history that they have accomplished that feat. The last two times they did it, it was 1968 and 1988. It's also the 15th occurrence this year where a Mets starter has gone five innings pitch without allowing a run, and that has included seven different pitchers, and those stats are courtesy of Greg Harvey on Twitter. Check him out. There's a lot of really interesting stuff. Now, Peterson was the headline of this game. As I just mentioned, the shutout for the Mets pitchers, it started uh, with Peterson, who was excellent. He went five and a third, allowed six hits, two walks, had seven strikeouts. In the sixth inning, Adam Adovino bailed him out of a little bit of trouble. There was two runners on base, and Adam Adovino came on, got a big ground ball, uh, which was a double play that got him out of that jam. Peterson actually did the exact same thing an inning prior. And if you look at what he did in this start, not a single fly ball out was recorded. There was a line out. You had seven outs on the ground, seven strikeouts. He picked off somebody. So that was how he got to those 16 outs. And if you look at what he's done this year, what's interesting is we're seeing an uptick in fastball. David Peterson was typically categorized as a sinker ball pitcher, a ground ball pitcher. Now, at times, we never quite know what stat cast is picking up, if it's accurate when it comes to what pitch was thrown. Sometimes they'll think a slider's a cutter or vice versa. Sometimes maybe a fastball is really a sinker, but it's getting picked up as a fastball. Regardless, there is a shift in the way his pitches are being categorized by stat cast this season. He's throwing the fastball more at 35% of the time, which is in line with the way he threw it in 2020. Last year, the mix-up between fastball and sinker was 29% fastball, 29% sinker usage. This year, it's 35% fastball, 15% sinker. Now, regardless of how you categorize those two pitches, if you're looking at hard stuff versus soft stuff, he went from throwing hard stuff 60% of the time last year to about 50% this year. And he's mixing in his slider, his changeup, and his curveball more. If you look at the breakdown between how batters fare against his hard stuff compared to his softer stuff, batters are slugging under 300 against his slider, his changeup, and his curveball, respectively. They're slugging over 400 against his fastball and his sinker. So it stands to reason that if he continues to do what he's done so far this year, which is you know, still mixing in the hard stuff, but throwing a fastball a little bit more than his sinker and then going more towards the, the slider, going to the changeup more. He's even mixing in a curveball more than ever before. Not a ton of it, but 5% of the time compared to 0.6% of the time last year is a big uptick. He is making that pitch part of his arsenal. By doing all that, he's keeping hitters off balance. And you see that in the game today against the Marlins, a whiff percentage on the game of 44% across all of his pitches is really great stuff. He's missing bats right now, and that's not necessarily something we would have expected from David Peterson going into the year. He's really proven that 
he could be a quality starter. I don't think he's ever going to be a frontline guy, but could he develop and, and continue to cement his place as a back end starter that gives you uh, um, plenty of you know quality outings across this season with maybe a couple of clunkers thrown in? I think he absolutely could do that, and he's shown so far this year he's been able to, to hold on and, and really um, find success and. Uh, obviously when Max Scherzer comes back, that would push Trevor Williams out of the rotation. And then assuming DeGrom comes back healthy, that would be Peterson's spot. But the way seasons go, you never know. He might be in this rotation for the remainder of this season. And the way he's pitched, that would not be the worst thing in the world. Now, if you talk about the offense in this game, it was just a typical grind it out Mets game. Um, in the first inning, though, if you would have told me the Mets would have got would have gotten the bases loaded with Pete Alonso up and nobody out and they'd only score one run, I'd be concerned. But you know what? They were able to to work around that, continue to add runs throughout the game. That one run that did come across in the first was on a bases loaded walk from Mark Canna. Pete Alonso struck out in that spot. JD Davis came up with bases loaded one out after Canna had walked and he struck out. Uh, Jeff McNeil flew out, so at least he got the bat on the ball. But it was a wasted opportunity um, until the fourth inning. That was the only run the Mets had. Now, with one out in the fourth, J.D. Davis came up and drew a walk. Then Jeff McNeil hit a double, which put two runners in scoring position for Eduardo Escobar, who drove in one with a sack fly. Then McNeil would score on a wild pitch. But unfortunately, on that play, McNeil pulled his hamstring and would leave the game. So that's something we'll talk about a little bit more in the next segment. Right now, we don't know much about it. He's going to get the imaging done, as we've seen with a lot of these injuries this year. The Mets have been avoiding a lot of problems, but McNeil does have a history of hamstring injuries, so hopefully that's not too significant. He's also set to hit the paternity leave any day now, so who knows? Maybe the timing coincides. He goes on the paternity list for a couple of days, gets off that hamstring, and maybe it will uh, sort of heal itself with some rest. You go to the fifth inning. Brandon Nemo and Starling Marte each singled. Lindor advanced the runners to second and third uh, with a ground out. Then Pete Alonso had a sacrifice fly that scored a run. The Mets scored two more in the eighth as Eduardo Escobar came through again, this time with an RBI single that drove in J.D. Davis and Louis Guillorme. And that is how the Mets got to their six runs. After David Peterson, I already mentioned Adam Onovino came on, got that double play ball. He would pitch another scoreless inning after that. Drew Smith came on for one. He was solid and the Mets had extended that lead to the point but they did not need to go to Edwin Diaz. They went to Yohan uh, Lopez, and he got the job done. Now, I want to talk about all the roster moves, though, because Dom Smith is back. That's why we're wearing the Dom Bomb shirt today. Uh, Daniel Polka apparently maybe with the taxi squad now, so a couple of new hitters into the mix. Jeff McNeil, potential injury. J.D. Davis got hit in the hand. Don't know if he's going to be okay. That's another one to talk about. Scherzer as well, so so much to impact when it comes to roster moves. That we're going to get to, but first, this episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. So, why endure the pointless and often intimidating questioning while the person behind the counter is just looking up the parts that they offer from their warehouse in their computer and they only have maybe one brand that they can go to from that select manufacturer when instead you could shop from hundreds of manufacturers at rockauto.com? Save 30%, 50%, maybe even 100% more on the exact same auto parts than, that you would get from that chain store or from a car dealership. Rock Auto is a family business that has been serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are reliably low for all customers. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find, the solution, to, to find the solution to your auto parts needs. Again, go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. And make sure you're right locked on in there. How'd you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliable, low prices, all the parts your car will ever need rockauto.com. All right. So let's go through all the different roster transactions that we could see over the next couple of days here. The first one already happened. Seth Lugo on paternity leave. Dom Smith came back. Now the Mets had to cut down to 13 pitchers on the active roster. And so that move achieved that we could see Lugo back in a couple of days and the Mets would have to make another decision there to stay at those 13 pitchers. The first move, though, after that is David Peterson likely expected to go on the paternity leave any day now. He could have missed this start because of it. Uh, so expect to see that in the next, who knows, maybe 48 hours. Same goes with Jeff McNeil, who also now has this hamstring injury to be worried about. 
if this hamstring injury is significant, which as of now, there's no indication that it is, then you could maybe see the Mark Vientos promotion. He's the only infielder on the 40 man roster, but considering his lack of defensive versatility, he's not a good defender pretty much anywhere you put him. I just don't see that um, in the short term. I still believe they're going to let him ride this thing out until the trade deadline and continue to rake in AAA and see what they have to do there before they call him up. So if not Vientos, you look at the other infielders in Syracuse that could replace Jeff McNeil. It's Gusuke Kato. He just got taken off the 40. He was DFA'd. He accepted an assignment to Syracuse. You got Travis Blankenhorn. You got JT Riddle. You got Cody Bohenick, and you got Luke Ritter. None of them have had good offensive seasons. Uh, if McNeil goes down for a week, what you're looking at right now is you got Dom to be your backup first baseman, J.D. Davis the backup third baseman. Every day you'd expect Eduardo Escobar, Francisco Lindor, Louis Guillorme, and Pete Alonso in your infield, uh, but you have some coverage at second with Escobar able to play there. You have some coverage at shortstop with Guillorme able to play there. And then again, you know Davis at either corner and Dom Smith backing up Pete at first base. Daniel Polka is an option, okay? He played left field, right field. He can play some first base for you, so he gives you a little bit of versatility, but he's also been a really solid hitter this year. He's leading Syracuse in home runs with 15, doubles with 11, RBIs with 47, has an 885 OPS, which also leads the team. His slugging percentage of 531 leads the team, and over his last 13 games in the last 15 days, he has really performed well, hitting 347 with a 414 on base, a 755 slugging, five home runs, and two doubles. I've talked about Polka a lot this year. I really like him. He's a big guy. I just think that he can run into some home runs for you and give you a different dynamic. Uh, so I would be interested to see um, what happens here. He traveled up to, to be with the Mets but did not get put on the roster. That could change, though, with another move. Maybe they just go with an extra bat when they put a, a Peterson on the paternity leave because they would then have the flexibility to do that. You're just basically putting one of your starting pitchers on leave, and maybe he could be back for his next turn in the rotation. Another option would be JT Riddle if you really want a, a backup infielder, only because he is hitting 324 over that 15 day span that Polk has been raking in as well. So he brings you that. When it comes to Dom Smith, here is, you know, a return of a guy that went down because he was really struggling. And he obviously offers more upside than, than any of these names we're talking about. He's done it at the big league level in the past. He has the capability to give you strong professional at-bats, just like we see from someone like J.D. Davis. But he hasn't given those at-bats with the same frequency of J.D. Davis, particularly this season when he has really struggled. I love to tell you that he's coming off an incredible stint in AAA, but that's not necessarily the case. He was solid, uh, 266 average in 15 games played, 347 on base. 438 slugging. He ran into two home runs, five doubles, 785 OPS, 10 RBIs, 12 runs scored. Not bad. And I think that uh, outside of just the numbers, the Mets were happy with the kind of at bats he was putting together, the swings he was putting on the ball. So th there is more that meets the eyes than just those surface level statistics. But, um, you know, he has to prove it now again. That That's just the fact. When you get sent down at that stage of your career into the minor leagues, Hopefully there's a chip on your shoulder that develops, but a lot still needs to be shown that he can continue to, to be where we all think he belongs, which is in the big leagues. Uh, the one person that I would look at also as a potential option down is Nick Plummer. Unfortunately, uh, whether it's a lack of consistent playing time or maybe just a struggle adjusting, he has not been good. He homered in his first two starts uh, since getting called up and has been hitless since in 20 at-bats. So I don't know how much longer they're going to continue with Nick Plummer. I could see the Mets, even if Jeff McNeil is just day-to-day, -day, I could still see the Mets saying, you know what, let's option Plummer, Let, let's add uh, Polka to the 40, and insert Polka onto the bench. He gives you a little bit more. Um, and he also still brings, uh, you know, even maybe actually a little more versatility than Plummer in his ability to play first base, but more importantly, um, I, I don't think you're going to be worried about, uh, you know, Polka wasting away on the bench as opposed to Plummer, where uh, if Dom Smith's now taking those at bats, you want Plummer to get regular playing time down in AAA. Now, the last little bit of news is that Max Scherzer will Max. Did I say Max Sugar? That sounds like Max Sugar. Max Scherzer 
Uh, we'll start a game with James McCann behind the dish in AAA on Tuesday. If all goes well there, we could see Scherzer back into the rotation potentially on Sunday. Uh, if not Sunday, the Mets have a day off on Monday. He could return against the Astros on the following Tuesday, which brings us to this upcoming series. It's essentially a, a split four-game set. Two games in Houston. You wait a week, then you play two games at City Field. How will the Mets fare? I'm going to preview what lies ahead in just a minute. But you know our friends at Bill are always coming out with some amazing new flavors, and they really have found another delicious offering for you with the Mud Pie flavor. For the first time ever, Bill is introducing the Mud Pie flavor, not only with the Mud Pie bar, but also with the Mud Pie puff. If you're not sure what a Mud Pie tastes like, if you're a chocolate fan, this is for you. The new Mud Pie is rich whipped cream and chocolate mousse smothered in 100% real chocolate topped with cookies and cream crumble. Mud pie bars and puffs are available at built.com right now, but they're going fast because they're just that delicious. And of course, they are healthy and tasty. What's great about Built is that all their bars are made with a collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. Eat something that tastes good and is good for you by going to built.com and use the promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your next order. Again, that's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built. Dot com. If you look at the breakdown of the Houston Astros season so far, they've had one incredible month and two so-so months. They were 11 and 10 in April. They were 21 and 8 in May, and they've been 9 and 7 in June thus far. You put it all together, that is a 41 and 25 record on the season. They are nine and a half games ahead of the free-falling Los Angeles Angels. Once again, running away with their division. They're five and five in their last 10, but they have won their last two series played. Now they've also been a top 10 offense this year based on OPS, but you go to run scored, they're ranked 20th. So the offense maybe leaves a little bit to be desired, but the pitching certainly picks up from that. Their starters have a 3-3-1 ERA this year, which is third best in baseball. Their bullpen has a 2-5-9 ERA, which is the best in baseball. You put it together for their team ERA and they trail only the Yankees and the Dodgers. So they have one of the best collective pitching staffs in baseball. First game of this series, it'll be Trevor Williams making the spot start essentially versus Jose Urquidy. Uh, Williams has a 3.53 ERA on the season. Urquidy has a 4.99 ERA. He's given up three or more earned runs in each of his last four starts and in seven of his 12 starts this year. So if there's one starting pitcher in this Astros rotation that you want to face, it's Urquidy. It's not Justin Verlander. It's certainly not Framber Valdez. It's not Luis Garcia, who they're going to see in game two. It's Arquiti. So that's a game you want the Mets to win, but they also got Trevor Williams out there. So it's a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> a crapshoot, basically. Um, you go to Wednesday, Carlos Carrasco, a 3.96 ERA. Luis Garcia, as I just mentioned, a 3.41 ERA. Uh, I've been pretty um, <laughs> out in front of the Carlos Carrasco bandwagon coming into the year, and I've not gotten off of it. Even though that ERA says 3.96, I still feel like he's been better than that. And right now in this rotation, just considering the you know one really rough stretch of Chris Bassett, until they get Scherzer back, Carrasco is still the guy that I think I trust the most with the ball in his hand. So I imagine they have a good opportunity to win that second game. Hopefully they can put up a bunch of runs on Arkady in the first one, and maybe they can get a little two-game sweep here. The way I would look at this series if I was the Mets is it's basically a four-game set. So if you want an opportunity to win this four-game set in the season series against the Astros, you got to split the first two, and then you got to try to sweep that second set. If you can sweep the first set, you do more of the heavy lifting on the front end, and then in the back end, maybe you can just take one of those two games. So we'll be talking about what happens um, in the first game of this contest tomorrow. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, check out the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft. If you search now, the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft has over 50 insiders involved, the Odyssey sports experts, the draft experts of the Locked On NBA Big Board. Uh, the five-episode Ultimate NBA Mock Draft is underway already. So make the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft your second listen today.